Today we're going to look at the Song of Solomon, chapter uh, 2, uh, verses 1 to 7. Uh, and we're going to look uh, at this famous statement that's made in chapter 2, verse 4, uh, famous in the sense that it's well known, especially amongst Christians. He brought me into the banqueting house, and his banner over me uh, was love. Uh, and of course, it's also a song. Uh, but in this song, of course, it's recorded as a song in this poem, here in the Song of Solomon. So we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Let's just pray before we start. Father, we thank you for this time we can turn to your word. Just pray that you would help us as we look at this passage. Uh, we pray that uh, the thoughts of the song uh, would flow uh, into our lives and into our hearts. We pray that as we read your word and think about it, we pray that you will mold and change uh, these lives by the Holy Spirit, change them to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the uh, themes of the Song of Solomon, the love and the affection between the bride and the bridegroom. Uh, we pray that there will be a deepening love in our relationship uh, with the Lord. Uh, we pray that this would be uh, an increase in intimacy uh, as we live our lives uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time together. Just pray that you would uh, use your word to speak to us, we pray in the Savior's name. Amen. So again, we'll turn to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 to 7. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose, and by the hinds of the fields, that you stir not up, nor wake my love, till, and in the Hebrew it says, till she please. And we know that God blesses the reading uh, of his word. Now remember, we've already looked at the outline of the Song of Solomon. Uh, six poems uh, all together, starting from chapter 1 uh, to the end of chapter 8. And of course, in these early poems, we see the love uh, of the king and the Shulamite in their courtship, leading up to chapter 3, verse 5, and then uh, the fulfillment of their courtship from chapter 3, verse 6, the first verse of chapter 5. Then from chapter 5, verse 2, the end of the book, uh, we see their deepening love in marriage. This chapter, of course, divides into two halves. The verses that we're looking at, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, they really deal with the end of the first poem. And we get that expression in verse 7, I charge you, O doors of Jerusalem. And that seems to break up the six poems uh, in the book of Song of Solomon. And then from chapter 8, verses 17, sorry, from chapter 8, verse 8 to 17, uh, we see the um, next poem starting, and that runs into chapter 3 and verse 5. And if you go back to the first poem, which we're looking at, uh, the tail end of it, chapter 1, verse 1, the supremacy of love, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. And there we see that... Uh, 1 Kings 4 says Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. Uh, this is the only one that's actually recorded in Scripture. Then we have the joy of love, verses 2 and 4 uh, of chapter 1, thy love is better than wine. And verse 4, we will be glad and rejoice in thee. And then verse six, uh, verses 5 and 6, the confession of love, uh, she sees her own unworthiness. And then verses 7 to 8, we see the desire of love. Tell me, O thou whom my soul lovest, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock that rest at noon. And so we see the desire, uh, the desire that uh, they would be together. And of course, that brings us to Psalm 73. Uh, Psalm of Asaph, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart fail. Uh, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion uh, forever. And here we see the desire that Asaph had 
um, to know something of intimacy with God, uh, and of course, also that he would be with God uh, forever. Then the section that we're reading, chapter 1, uh, verse 9 to chapter 2, verse 6, we see the communion of love, uh, the fellowship of love uh, that there is uh, together. And again, uh, we see that the bridegroom speaks uh, in verses 9 to 11. Uh, compare thee, O my love. Uh, and that goes down then, verse 12. Uh, we see the bride speaks, the king's at the table. My spark now sent it forth the smile, uh, the smell thereof. Then the bridegroom speaks, verse 15, Behold thou fear my love. And then the bride speaks uh, from the end of verse 16, sorry, verse 16, right down to the first verse of uh, chapter 2 that we are looking at. And of course, what she says in verse 1, excuse me, is, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Uh, and of course, uh, we see that this is not the language of self-esteem. Uh, in the words of Hudson Taylor, the bride says, in effect, thou callest me fair and pleasant. Remember, that's what the bridegroom has said in verse 15. Uh, the fairness and pleasantness of thine iron by the wild flower. That's the idea in verse 1. Uh, a lowly, scentless rose of Sharon. Uh, I'm not exactly, no, sometimes some suggest it's the autumn crocus or the lily or a lily of the valley. Uh, but either way, uh, we can see that there's a humility in the description that she gives uh, of herself. Some actually doubt the precise identity of the plant, uh, but there can be no doubt, whatever the plant is, that in her own estimation, she is just like a little flower in the plain of Sharon, or like a lily blooming in the valleys. <clears throat> According to G. Lloyd Carr, uh, who has written an Old Testament commentary on Song of Solomon, uh, the word translated rose is derived from a Hebrew verb, which means to form bulbs, which gives support to general consensus that the plant here describes one of the bold family. Of course, but no one knows the exact which one of that bold family it is. Uh, however, the details of the plant mustn't divert our attention from the fact uh, that the more we remember our rich blessings in Christ, <clears throat> the more conscious we are of our own personal unworthiness. And you remember that uh, Paul spoke in Ephesians chapter 3 uh, of the great privilege that was given unto him, uh, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? Uh, what a great uh, privilege this was for the Apostle Paul, uh, the a converted Pharisee who persecuted Christians, and yet Paul never lost his sense. In fact, as he got older, he had an increased awareness of his personal unworthiness uh, for the task that God had given him to do. Uh, and of course, here in Ephesians 3, we see the grace that was given to him. He counts himself as the less than the least of all the saints. Uh, and of course, he has to preach uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then, of course, in First Timothy, uh, he would say, First Timothy chapter 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry where it was before I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And so Paul always had an awareness of his own unworthiness and the fact that God had spoken to him. Then in verse 2, the bridegroom speaks, As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among uh, the daughters. He agrees uh, in response that she's indeed a lily, but a lily among thorns and then so is my love among the daughters, which doesn't say much for the daughters, uh, referring to the daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, but as Jim Flanagan uh, rightly says, it is so with the believer today, 
who lives for the pleasure of God in a world of thorns. And of course, we must remember these are only pictures of the relationship between the believer and Christ. Uh, the immediate interpretation, of course, is uh, for Solomon and the Shunammite. Well, nevertheless, thorns were introduced in the day of a man's disobedience as a sign of the curse. They are mentioned unfavorably many times in scripture, until at last they crowned with thorns him who suffered and died to redeem men from the curse of uh, the law. Uh, and of course, uh, we can apply this, and uh, again, it's only an illustration or picture that we can apply to ourselves, uh, to Christ and the church. In his eyes, then, his church has a beauty of fragrance, a moral attractiveness, and a world of brambles, a world stamped with the curse on every hand. Uh, and of course, again, it's only an illustration uh, of the relationship between uh, the believer and the Lord Jesus. Then verses three to six, uh, we see that the bride speaks again. Uh, the bridegroom has described as a lily among the thorns in verse two, uh, but the bride replies, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved uh, among the sons. And so what we can't miss is the uh, mutual affection uh, with each other. And again, when we come to this expression, the apple tree, uh, again, there is no exact identity. In fact, this word is found in chapter two, verse five, comfort me with apples. Uh, and again, in chapter seven and verse eight, chapter seven, verse eight, I said, I'll go up to the palm tree, I'll take hold of the boughs thereof, uh, and the smell of thy nose like apples. Uh, and again, in the reference in chapter eight as well. And it's also used in Proverbs five and Joel chapter one. Uh, it seems to be one of the important agricultural trees associated with the vine, the pomegranate, and the date palm. Uh, and of course, the fruit was aromatic in its taste, and that's referenced in chapter seven, uh, but they don't actually know which tree uh, it exactly is. Well, of course, again, we mustn't uh, let that detract away from the uh, main point, and the main point being made here is just as the bride is described as a lily among the thorns, so the beloved is described as an apple tree among the trees of the wood. Uh, the Hebrew word uh, that's used uh, is a rugged mountainous place, that, that expression among the trees. Uh, this does seem to be an acceptable interpretation. Uh, it could certainly be applied to someone with all his distinctiveness and even more um, to the Lord Jesus. I suppose what uh, the Shunaman is pointing out is his distinctiveness. Uh, when we think of the Lord Jesus, this is even more beautiful. Psalm 45 verse two, uh, we know that the Lord Jesus is fairer than the sons of men. Then Hebrews chapter one, in fact, the whole of the chapter is concerned with showing us that Christ is better uh, than angels. Then he's greater than the patriarchs, John chapter four, uh, verse 12. Uh, you remember the woman of Samaria said, art thou greater than thy uh, father Jacob? Then Matthew chapter 12, he's greater than the priests. He's greater than the prophets and he's greater than the kings. Uh, Hebrews chapter one describes him as above thy fellows. Ephesians chapter one says he is far, uh, is uh, ascended far above all principalities and powers and mights uh, and dominions. And of course this book, of course, the Song of Solomon chapter five, uh, when we think of the picture, he is chiefest among 10,000. And of course, Jim Flanagan finishes, this is our beloved among uh, the sons. And so there, as we, at this point, the bride expresses her enjoyment of her ever deepening relationship First, she is sitting under his shadow in verse three, and then she is feasting the banqueting house in verse four and five, and then she is enjoying, is enjoying his embrace in verse six. In the first case, light is involved, and in the second, life, and in the third, uh, love. Uh, and so when we come to verse three, we come to sitting uh, under his shadow. And here she describes her beloved as a shade giving tree. Uh, and of course, there's a number of things that we see here. Uh, and Jim Flanagan has suggested 
And first of all, she enjoyed rest. She sat down. And then she enjoyed refuge under his shadow. And then she enjoyed rapture with great delight. Uh, and then she enjoyed refreshment. His fruit was sweet to my taste. Uh, we take things along that line. It makes very interesting application to the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we think of the rest. I sat down uh, and we think of the Lord Jesus who is here uh, and on earth and he sat down to rest. You remember John chapter 4 verse 6. He's just there for being weary with his journey and that word weary means labored to the point of exhaustion. Sat down on a well. Uh, he knows all about our weariness and is therefore able to help us uh, in our weariness. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor on a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Uh, let's remember that uh, we also have a high priest uh, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You remember when God appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18? Uh, he appeared to Abraham as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Uh, we all know something of the burn and the heat of the day. Uh, we live in, in a temperate zone climatically, but isn't a temperate zone spiritually. There are battles to be fought in the Christian life. Victories to be won and temptations uh, to resist. And so uh, what we see here is that uh, the Lord Jesus is with us in all of those situations. Then there was the refuge. Uh, and here we read in verse uh, 3 that she sat under his shadow. Here is the shadow of a tree that affords refuge from the heat of the day. In Isaiah, there's a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 2. In the Psalms, it is the shadow of thy wings. Uh, in each case, whether it's a tree or rock or the wings, uh, we cannot fail to think of the Lord Jesus uh, because to be in someone's shadow means keeping near to them. Uh, and of course, the psalmist puts these two ideas together in Psalm uh, 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, of course, this is where the Apostle Paul dwelt. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. That was Paul's refuge uh, when he had to stand before Nero. Uh, he realized that the Lord was with him and that's where he took his refuge. But then there was the great delight. Uh, as she said, I sat under his shadow with great delight. And emphasis there is on the rapture and she was so taken up uh, with the beloved. And of course, the Lord Jesus anticipated this whilst he was here on earth. Psalm 16, verses 9 to 11. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy and at thy right hand are pleasures for evermore. Uh, and what we see here is that um, the Lord Jesus, uh, he found his delight uh, in obeying the Father. Uh, and of course, for the Christian, we can find all our delight, or at least we should find all our delight in Christ. First Peter chapter 1, Whom having not seen, ye love. Uh, though ye... See him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. And what we see here is that it's possible for us as Christians to have that deep uh, sense of joy and intimacy with Christ uh, because it comes from our relationship with Christ, uh, the Lord Jesus. And then we see the refreshment his fruit was sweet to my taste. If we were to ask where the fruit of the Spirit uh, is seen to perfection, we can only give one answer, uh, and that is the Lord Jesus. His fruit was certainly sweet to our taste. Uh, we think of his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, 
his faithfulness, his gentleness, his self-control. Uh, and as we think upon that, it fills our hearts with joy. Uh, and we need to not say any more. Uh, his fruit was sweet to my taste. And so here we see in application all these things applied um, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the second thing is, it wasn't just the refuge of the tree, there was the feasting in the banqueting house in verses 4 and 5. Uh, and before we move on, we can go back uh, and look at the progress of the movement on the part of the spouse. Uh, and this is suggestive of uh, the believer and the day of fellowship with Christ. It begins in the intimacy of the king's apartment in chapter 1. verse 4 uh, chapter 1 verse 4 the king had brought me into his inner chambers and then in the morning and till noon she is following resting with the flock chapter 1 verse 7 tell me thou O thou who my soul loveth where thou feedest where thou makest thy flock to rest or lie down at noon uh, and then later on she will sit down with him at the table chapter 1 verse 12 while the king sitteth uh, at his table or in his circle, my spike not sent him forth the smell uh, thereof. In the afternoon, she enjoys their company together as they recline together on the couch under the boughs of the cedar. Chapter 1, verse 17 The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters are of fir or cypress. And in the late afternoon, she's found at the table in the shade uh, with him. Uh, refreshed by his fruit this is chapter 2 and verse 3 now as the day closes she has gone to the banqueting house uh, and of course this continues as we go through uh, the remainder of this poem uh, of course for the application of course is to ourselves whether in private or in company in the quietness of meditation or in the bustle of service uh, it is essential for the saint to know the blessedness uh, of the presence of the Lord. Uh, in all our movements mentioned here, the bride is with her beloved, and so it must be uh, for every Christian today. And all that is done for our beloved, the ancient prayer of Moses uh, is so necessary. If thy presence go not with me, carry us not hence. Exodus chapter 33, verse uh, 15. We see now that the uh, bride is at the Mangleton house. Uh, and there's general agreement that the Bankton house is actually the house of wine. Uh, and of course, we really looked uh, earlier on in the Song of Solomon to see that wine was a picture of joy. Uh, and therefore, the house of wine was a place of joyful feasting and banqueting. Uh, but one thing is certain that this Bankton house is not resembled anyway the Bankton house of Belshazzar. You remember in Daniel chapter 5, uh, it was completely different. There they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and stone and wood. Here this banquet house is completely different. Uh, the banner, if we put like this, was judgment uh, in Daniel chapter 5. Thou art found in the balance, thou art weighed in the balances and felt wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. But here in the Song of Psalms it is so different because the expression that's next used in verse four, his banner over me was love. Uh, in the banqueting house of heaven, the redeemed will say, Revelation chapter one, verses five and six, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood 
and have made us kings and priests unto our God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and what uh, one this will be for every Christian is that uh, heaven will be uh, such a joyful place uh, because there will be the eternal aspect uh, of the love of God will be brought home to us. And again, we mentioned the love of Christ is mentioned three times in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, and that should really encourage and comfort us uh, even today that to know that we can't be separated from the love of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, the love of Christ constrains us. So the love of Christ should be the motivating force for everything that we do for the Lord. And then Ephesians 3, verse 19, uh, it says to know the love of Christ. And that should be a uh, deepening intimacy and awareness of the love of God uh, in our lives. Uh, and of course, none will forget when we get to heaven that it was his love that brought them into the banqueting house. Uh, as the redeemed in the future gaze on the Lamb of God and all his glory, uh, they will exclaim, he brought me. Uh, and of course, uh, this is what we read here in verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house. You think of blind Bartimaeus who could say uh, with perfect sight, he brought me. Zacchaeus, uh, with all his scheming and chief tax collector, uh, he will say, he brought me. The dying thief will say, he brought me from the depths of eternity. And so will we, every Christian, be able to say that as well. Uh, let's remember Isaiah chapter 53 uh, verse 7, he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth, but he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. <coughs> what is interesting is that the Lord Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and all that we might be brought into his banqueting house. And of course, for the spouse, this was overwhelming. Verse 5, staying with flagons and comfort me. Uh, with apples, for I am sick of his love. It hardly needs to be said that she's not fed up with the Bangleton house or with her beloved. Uh, she was just overcome by it all. She therefore asked for something to strengthen and reinvigorate her. And uh, for the record, we're told that flagons or flagons of wine were delicacies in the forms of raisin cakes. Um, these seem to be sweet meals made of pressed grapes. Uh, and that seems to be um, what she needed uh, to sustain her. But how are Christians strengthened and reinvigorated? Uh, and you remember in Ephesians chapter 3 and chapter 1, uh, Paul prayed for the Christians. And this is what he prayed in chapter 1. For example, I cease not to give thanks for you make a mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, they give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Uh, and this is what Paul prayed for the Christians, um, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so Paul prayed for uh, ever increasing, uh, deepening knowledge of Christ, uh, a day by day uh, getting to know God and know Christ. And then in chapter 3, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he will grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. These in chapter 3, verse 14 um, to 16. And so Paul prayed for the spiritual strength. And again, that's repeated in Colossians chapter 1, um, to pray for spiritual strength. Uh, by the Holy Spirit um, in the inner man. But the bride uh, didn't get the flagons or apples she wanted. She got something much better. Verse 6, his left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. Uh, and of course, David Cain puts it like this. He's read a commentary on Song of Solomon. Uh, her desire is granted and her head is supported to gaze intently into his face. As his strengthened arms uphold, joys rise higher, communion more sweet is known, and tender intimacies thrill the soul. She is upheld by the sense of his presence or of his near presence, and so are we. Unless you remember Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness, 
and be content with such things as you have, for he have said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And let's remember that we have, uh, or at least we should have an awareness of his presence uh, in our everyday lives. Israel, of course, was told the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Uh, but this is more intimate. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. And of course, the right hand uh, is symbolic of strength. Uh, the Shunammite refers to the left and right hands of her beloved, uh, but the believer today enjoys something better. The Lord Jesus uh, refers to the security afforded by his hand and by the Father's hand. Uh, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then verse 29. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And of course this uh, brings the conclusion, this first poem, uh, having looked at the supremacy of love in verse 1 of chapter 1, the joy of love, verses 2 to 4 of chapter 1, the confession of love, verses 5 to 6, the desire of love, verses 7 to 8, and then verse, the fellowship of love, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 9, and chapter 2, verse 6, uh, we come to the rest of love. And again, this uh, expression which we get, I charge you, O the daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awake my love till she please, uh, that is the Hebrew. Uh, that seems that is the dividing point uh, of the six poems. Since the speaker refers to the addressee as my love, uh, it is the king who is speaking. Uh, of course, Hudson Sailor is quite clear about this. The pronoun here and chapter 3 verse 5 with chapter 8 verse 4 should not be he as in the authorized but uh, it should be she. Uh, in this case Solomon is saying her rest is not to be disturbed and Hudson Taylor says it is never his will, the Lord's will that our rest in him should be disturbed. In charging the doors of Jerusalem Solomon probably refers, um, to, uh, sorry, he refers to the gazelles and the hinds of the field uh, because they're the most sensitive and easily start, startled of all the creatures uh, of the field. Uh, and of course, uh, David Cain continues here, may the Lord help us to be as keenly sensitive to the approach of anything that would interfere with the blessedness of intimate communion with himself. Those who know its joys are painfully aware that such moments of bliss can be disturbed so easily. Uh, unless, as we close, uh, really drive this home uh, to our own lives is that we need to have that intimate communion uh, with the Lord each day and uh, sadly we have to say there are many things which can disturb uh, uh, that flow of fellowship with Christ uh, but we must make an effort uh, just as the king said there's not anything to disturb uh, her sense of his love and let us pray that in our Christian life there will be nothing that would disturb us uh, from the appreciation of the love uh, that God has for us. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that uh, you desire that we have fellowship with you. Uh, Father, remember in the Garden of Eden, it was God who said, where art thou? And Father, we thank you that you desire to have fellowship with us. And we do thank you that for every Christian, it's possible to have um, this deepening sense of fellowship with you through your word and through prayer. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the uh, times when we experience this in our own lives uh, we thank you the scripture says in thy presence uh, is fullness of joy and uh, pray that we will know something of this deep intimacy uh, with you each day and uh, to be growing in our relationship and fellowship with you uh, and to think of the glories of christ father then we just thank you for the lord jesus and just pray that you would help us to be uh, drawn closer to him uh, in our daily lives help us lord to really um, have this uh, sense of constant fellowship with you even throughout the day and even in the business of the day or the quietness of the day uh, help us lord to have that sense and awareness of your presence so thank you for this time together pray use this message for your glory pray lord you would occupy us with your love uh, with your son the lord jesus christ help us lord to show the character of christ in our lives 
as a result of this uh, deepening relationship we can have with you through your word and through prayer. So we give thanks now and praise you. Use this message for your glory. In the Savior's name, amen.